All right, uh, can, can everyone see everything? Great. Awesome. So in previous scholarship, a divide has emerged wherein Tchenes are seen as either radical, intimate, and private texts that were ran the home according to purely the reader's own wants, or communal and public texts that were part of a shared semi-standardized liturgy. Reading Tchenes as solely personal texts is troubling as it neglects how they operate holistically. Conversely, Excluding the intimate in Tchenes ignores the power of the personal. Similarly, where grief is an acknowledged element of Tchenes, it's been neglected. In this examination, Tchenes through rituals for creating candles, we're going to see how they operate holistically, in the home, in the public, and as labor. Using Sarah Ahmed's discussion of pain to slide into grief, I will first demonstrate that Sarah Bastovin in her Tchena for making candles on air of Yom Kippur uses grief to both define the borders of the intimate self and dismantle those same borders. Continuing with Sarah Bastovin's Tchena and Bella Chagall's account of candle making, we will see how grief's recollections enlarge the presence of the dead, allow intimate memories to be shared communally, and for the community to be invited into the intimate. Finally, moving backwards in the ritual process of candle making to field mustin, we will see that from the outset, the intimacy of grief performed through Tchenes makes a claim to a public understanding of the holiness of grief. Ultimately, we will see how Tchenes are a space of ritual transgression that dismantles the border of the personal and communal. Typically, Tchenes have been characterized as private and intimate texts meant to be set at home at a flexible time. Spontaneous tachinas, tachinas done publicly, or tachinas done for payment, have been framed as an exception. More recently, there's been, uh, there's been challenges to this general attitude. Devorah Kay and Sayer Tachinas pushes back on the notion that tachinas are intimate and private texts. She argues that tachinas may represent a liturgical replacement of standard daily prayers, and that these texts should be considered communal texts. Kay argues that by making tachinas communal, the personal loses significance. I disagree. Uh, if the whole community is implicated in, in the intimate meaning making of Tchenes, then one's most personal feelings are elevated to a shared understanding. So looking at grief, we can see exactly how the personal operates within the community and vice versa. So grief hasn't gone unmentioned in the study of Tchenes, but it has been danced, danced around and dismissed. Tchenes have been described as lacrimose, defined by tears and vocal outcries and emotional outpourings. More derisively, Tchenes has also been summed up as a sad chapter in the sad lives of Russian Jewish women with little merit. Oof. Uh, despite what appears to me an attitude defined by common sense, um, grief hasn't been seriously examined. Uh, speculatively, perhaps in contemporary scholarship, there's an understandable reluctance to examine the very aspect of the text that has been used uh, against them. However, I believe that by looking at what necessitated such a chauvinistic response, we open ourselves uh, up to understanding the very aspects that made Tchenes so re resonant. An affectual reading of grief in Tchenes that incorporates labor allows us to understand how these te texts spoke to, resonated, and moved with the people who wrote them, spoke them, and loved them. In other words, by using, an af uh, using affect theory to study grief, we gain a new lens to how Tchenes operate in a felt, holistic world. So affect theory, for th those who don't know it, uh, allows us to examine how our emotions, feelings, and sensations are not only interior or exterior. How we feel changes the way we understand and interact with things uh, around us and vice versa. For example, a uh, text that is performed changes how, is it, how it's received and how we feel changes how it's performed. In such a way, affect theory isn't, isn't related to the nature of the emotion itself, but what it does. Affect theory is the process of naming the smell in the room. It's the otherwise unacknowledged emotional sense-based response created in collaboration with our surroundings. There's of course an obvious challenge to using an affectual reading of these texts, which are so removed from our lives. Affect is culturally based. It relies on recognition and recollection as much as an immediate feeling. This can't stop us, but instead demands a caution. We will necessarily impose on the text our own alienation from it. We're participants in the affect of the text as much as we are observers. Following this, texts that indicate when, where, and how it was read, observations on how it would have been performed, and memoirs regarding the feeling become critical in studying said feeling. 
Fortunately, we are lucky to have some small measure of all of these aspects in our study of Tachinus. We will see that grief, like all emotion, slimes around from and to love and bewilderment and critically from pain. Pain has been thoroughly examined by Sarah Ahmed in The Politics of Emotion, where she highlights how pain creates itself and then transgresses it. I argue that this affective reading of pain can be extended into grief in order to similarly demonstrate its transgressive qualities. Like pain, grief makes and unmakes the body and connects it to memory. Yet taking it further, while pain transgresses the border, uh, borders of the body, a grief goes even farther, blurring the personal and communal. In Ahmed's writing, pain goes beyond the recognition of damage, but what pain does itself. Similarly, grief must be examined for what it does itself, beyond the recognition of loss. However, however where Ahmed describes emotions as almost being placed onto texts, and therefore not innate or essential, I disagree. Instead of borrowing from Ansetovich, I look at the way texts and spaces are sites of embodied feeling. This is a crucial distinction, as if grief is both a public and private force, then so too are the texts themselves. So, critically, uh, pain both defines and uh, undefines the boundaries of the body. Amund illustrates this with this example of stubbing her toe, though the cause is external, one suddenly aware of the end of the table and the end of the toe through the encounter. In reverse, internal pain from menstruation is often compared to a knife in the gut, uh, externalizing the internal pain and violating the boundaries of the body. The body is then uh, both more than itself, as it's intrinsically tied to the world around it, and less, as pain be begin brings its limitations to forefront. Likewise, grief makes and unmakes the body while also drawing harsh boundaries. In Sarah Bastobin's uh, Tichina Before Making Candles from the Larger Tichina of Three Gates, we can see, see a clear illustration of this phenomenon of grief both documented and performed. Sarah Bastobin's Tichina instructs us that this is to be read before making candles on Arab Yom Kippur. Rather than being just a private text, this tachina implicates a whole process of rituals commonly understood. The custom of making candles like this was both widespread and considered internally a mitzvah. I'm of the opinion that this tachina comes in the middle of this pro process after measuring the thread needed, needed, but before actually making it as the candles are for Yom Kippur, and this is meant to be read on air of Yom Kippur. There's a time crunch. So, the action we picture here begins in the home, post-measuring and assembling, with warmed wax and numerous lengthy threads at the ready. Created from this process is a candle for the living and the dead. Before even entering this text, we see here there's an obvious separation between the living and the dead. So the separation of the wicks, the living body is created and made separate from the dead and her grief. She's in the home, they are in the grave, and in the wicks that she prepares. Yet as Sarah prepares the wick, she invites embodied feeling into the text. When preparing her second wick, she asks God to remember the merit of the pain of Sarah when Isaac was taken to the binding, and she connects us to the fear of losing her own children. Here, it's critical to point out the biographical clues Sarah Bastobin leaves for us tells us that she at this time was childless. As Sarah Bastobin remembers the biblical Sarah, She's not only hypothetically connecting the fear of losing a child, but sheltering her own grief within the biblical Sarah, embodying previous generations of pain. Just as the feeling of pain is rhetorically tied to the external, so too is her initial grief coming from outside. It's the biblical Sarah's pain that comes for the first, before her own grief, it defines the body, authorizing it where the self begins, by where grief has invaded. Yet, the body is also unmade as it is extended through embodying the pain of others. Further, just as pain as it is a process of memory and recollection, in examining Sarah Bastobin's Tachina with Bella Chagall's re recollection of making candles, we can see that grief is similar. So, just as much as pain is a process of recognition that defines the borders of the body, it's a process of recollection. If I'm walking around my home, and I feel a sharp prick in my toe, I'm immediately gonna go to the instances of similar pain and I'm gonna check my feet for sewing needles. This process extends the body and enlarges a particular area in pain. Grief works similarly. So the process and performance of recollection, the body is extended beyond the self. We look to the places of absence where a loved one used to sit or where a beloved dog used to be walked to. This stretches us through time and to the others that we feel in absence, more there than ourselves. 
Grief, however, takes us even further than pain, as the recollection is, isn't just of a personal nature, but draws on the shared memory of others, pulling the communal close to the personal. As Sarah continues, she calls out for the sake of the souls who lie in the fields, in the forest, and for all the martyrs, and for those who had no children, and the little children that die. This isn't an abstract recollection. It's not for the dead in general, but it's a specific set of imagery meant to bring about a specific recollection. Even from our position as removed readers, we know the word murder. We can attach a meaning to it and can recall passed down examples. Considering Sarah's speculated flight from Podolia, perhaps she can recall names and faces and personal stories. Similarly, we recall hopefully living children and our care towards them and can imagine through that care, their loss. Sarah Beth Chetovi may have lost her own children and the woman reciting may have, lost, uh, may have lost children as well or known others. In this space, recollection enlarges the dead. We extend out to them and they are brought into the room as we prepare to make their candles. Bella Chagall's 1946 memoir of her, of her childhood in Vietzburg uh, describes this enlarged recollection as only strengthening as the process of making the candles continues. Here, a tachana is joined with the physical act of ritual. As Chagall's mother recites the tachana and runs thread and wax, the community is brought into the personal and joined together in an intimate felt space. When they reach the thread for Chagall's grandmother and this portion of the associated tachana, the palpable grief brought forth in recollection is heartbreaking. In Chagall's word, the words, mother prays over the thread she has drawn out. Apparently, she would like to linger with her mother as long as possible. She moves the wax slowly and does not let the thread go from her hands. May all of us live long for my deceased little son, Benjamin. Mother begins to be weep again. At this point, I can no longer check myself. I weep too over my little brother who was one year old when he died and, who died and whom I never saw. The skein of threads grows thicker and thicker. Dead relatives, members of closely and distantly connected families come as on a visit to us. In this ritual, the dead are brought into the space in two immediate ways. They're emotionally in the room in the enlarged presence of memory. This is this grief is shared. Even though Chagall never met her brother, she feels alongside her mother and all three become closer together. The dead are also in the room physically and powerfully as a whole community is in the felt space of the hand. The skein of wax threads become a manifestation of the dead tangibly in the room. Further, by implicating a wide network of people in the intimate ritual, the public enters the room. Where Sarah Bastoving wishes for the dead to awaken from their graves, in the tremble of Bella's mother's hands, they have. The community is tied in with the personal, shared, and excuse me, living. Like pain, grief unmakes the self and ties it to the external. Moving backwards in time to the measuring of graves and creation of the candle wicks, we can see that even before Sarah Bastobin speaks, it's not just that the public community is brought into the intimate in Tachana and ritual, but that the intimate is brought into the public. While pain and almonds reading makes and unmakes the body, grief uh, brings the personal and intimate into the public. Making the wicks for the candles requires a ritual measuring of graves called Feldmesten. In brief, Depending on the amount of money she could spend, a woman would hire one or two others to measure a grave wall or whole cemetery, cemetery with the doubled up threads used to make candle wicks. The hired Feldmesten sings her own tchina. One of the measures tchina is recorded in S. Weisenberg's 1906 anthropological study, and it bears significant resemblance to the tchina recorded in Bella Chagall's memoir. It calls on relations and friends, distance and close, for help and guidance. However, here, these personal requests come from the buyer, yet are in the mouth of the reciter. The love and blessings are personal, yet it's in the public performance that they are materialized. Further, the space of the cemetery is made central by rituals, including running the wicks over a tuft of cemetery grass held by the measure, emphasizing the connection of personal feeling to public space. Literally a holy place, hail and ort, a cemetery is not just a physical place of the dead, but a site of communication. Often in the center of town, the holiness of, grave, uh, of the grave is not abstract, but compo compounded by the fact that it is one's own loved ones in the earth. Thus, when Sarah Bass Tobin spoke of the martyrs and children who lay in the earth, she's not just speaking of her own memories and loves, 
but a public understanding of holiness. She is staking a claim to a shared understanding of the bewilderingly sacred physical space of grief, where one is both in loving communication with a deceased relative and simultaneously tearfully together with an entire town. The Tekhana cannot be private. It relies on the collective, yet it cannot be without being intimately personal as that's what makes it holy. Feldmesten drags one's personal and intimate connect connections into the public and communal. Others might have been looking on, purposefully or not. Another woman might be two graves over, performing her own ritual. Finally, compounding the strangeness of the space, the candle for the dead burns in the synagogue with that of your neighbor. Your grief, your tachana, your labor burns next to your neighbors. Fair Bastobin invites you to recall your most personal grief and stretch them out to others. Bel Chagall recalls the tachana done in the home with heartbreaking memories that nevertheless imagine a whole community on the, alongside. And the, and the measure drapes your grief over her hand, placing it in the public. Grief in the Tachana transgress the gate between public and private, making a claim to a shared understanding of meaning. Thank you.